Welcome to Integrative Lawyers of the World, where we believe that lawyers can and do contribute to the healing of the world. Hi, I'm your host, Carrie Raleigh, and our guest this episode is Deborah Sigrat from Cape Town, South Africa. Deborah is an accredited mediator and facilitator and has been trained in collaborative law. Deborah stopped litigation in 2019 and now solely focuses on mediation and collaborative cases. She resides in False Bay, Cape Town, and has three adult sons. We thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoy our episode and our conversation with Deborah. And please be sure to check out other episodes and to support the Integrative Law Movement at www.integrativelaw.com. Hi, Deborah. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for inviting me, Carrie. We're so happy that you are here and you are joining us from Cape Town, South Africa. That's correct. You and I were talking a little bit. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned about how the power was out and how you had to get your cord conductor and the power sharing loads. For us who are not in South Africa, can you describe that to me? And so that we can all realize, you know, sometimes we take power for granted. And so what is the load sharing like in South Africa? So 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 we don't call it load sharing, we call it load shedding. Oh, so load shedding. <laughs> shedding. And okay. so I thought you almost said something different there. At no, first. no, 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 no. Load shedding. Load shedding. <laughs> and it's been really bad for the last six months and we could, and there's various levels. Uh, the highest level we've reached is level six for a couple of months on end. And what that means is that if you're on load shedding level six, that there will be 10 hours a day, you have no access to electricity whatsoever in two or three different tranches, either two to four hours in a 24 hour cycle. And so um, it's, it's, it's tricky. Um, being South African, we work around it. You try and ensure that all your devices are uh, charged, your phone, your laptop, and everything, so that they can last the two, hopefully the four hours, uh, where you may not have access to electricity. And it just so happened today. And also, we unplug our devices because when the electricity comes on, there can often be a, a, a power surge. And so there's an amazing amount of appliances and laptops that the surge causes them to break. And to the extent that our, most of the major insurance companies in South Africa have changed their policy conditions and will not pay any claims for appliances that break due to these power surges. So I hadn't had my laptop uh, recharged because I always make sure it's out because I'm worried that I might miss when it comes on and it could uh, fry my laptop. Um, and then when I, and I didn't look at the schedule for today and then I suddenly realized that, that I didn't have power. Then I thought, no problem, I've got a power bank to realize that my youngest son had taken it. And so, <laughs> so then I thought, oh my goodness, it's only coming on after two. What will I do? And I went to a neighbor and they had, and I could charge from, from their place. So that's that's the reality of what we live with. We have a gas stove, so it's not too much of a problem in terms of cooking in the evening. Um, and I make candles. What can one say? That just shows some of the values of um, integrative law in that, boy, you were committed to being here today by doing all that to find it, <laughs> uh, to find us and community and camaraderie with your neighbors, right? So yeah, thank yeah. you for that thank you, and thank you. thank you for your neighbors. I just, um, does it make a, do you, I guess it must be making a difference with the energy levels and the energy support levels in the country um, otherwise they wouldn't be doing it that's a question and a statement uh, I, don't, I don't know which it is uh, they, regrettably that for many years that maintenance of our power stations has not been maintained so we have large amounts of unplanned maintenance needs uh, so 
So some of it is maintenance and planning and administration, not even directly related to energy supply. No, no. It's because there's unplanned maintenance, which is a large reason for um for the situation we're in. There's a brilliant book, if I may just give a punt by, who was our CEO of ESCOM, uh, who was our CEO for three years, and he taught, and his book's called Truth to Power. Um, and he talks about, it's beautifully written, and it's very recent, came out in April. Um, who is about it by? Andre de Reiter, A-N-D-R-E, de, D-E, Reiter. I think it's R-U-Y-T-E-R. Um, and his book's called Truth to Power, and he talks about the energy crisis in South Africa and when he took over and everything. It's a brilliant book. So it gives you a good insight if there's anyone who's interested. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, energy is something that we all depend on, and it's, you know, in one way, it connects us all throughout the world because we all share in the supply of it, not evenly and not equitably. I think it's to be mindful of, wow, some other countries do have to do this load shedding. Yeah. Um, load shedding. Oh. And do they generally, do they do they give you notice on, like, how yes. much notice would they give you? Um, we, we've got a very good system. We have an app that's called ESKIM, which is our power utility. So PUSH, which is very South African, mm -hmm. uh, which means to push ESKIM. And you can go on it at any time, load whichever area you want, and you will see a schedule for the next five days at the different levels. So the only thing that you've got to see is what level are we at now. And it's different levels during the day. So by and large, they go into a higher level after four o'clock every day because um, uh, they try and keep uh, businesses to have as much electricity as they can during the day. Um, and so the impact's more in the evening uh, for home. But it has a great impact. Uh, I know someone who is on an um, a oxygenated um, condenser. She was on a ventilator for eight months with COVID. And so she has constant uh, supply. And when there's load shedding from two to four or two to six in the morning, they have to put on a generator so that her oxygen can still work. I didn't think about things like that. So my trivialities are small in comparison to to having to work around that you need life sustaining oxygen. Are hospitals exempt from it? Like no, mm -mm. it's a big debate at the moment. So no, so a lot of hospitals have their own generation capacity. Capacity. Some are uh, managed to get a continuous flow, but it is by no means across the board. Some of your bigger hospitals, like. Cure, Red Cross, whatever, but it's by no means across the board. Wow, so that's quite scary. And there's been deaths, there's been deaths. Shows you how much our life is dependent on energy um, and our responsible use of it. There's so much more to go into here. I will definitely, I'm going to get his book. I'd like to read that, the Truth to Power book. Thank you for recommending that. Thank you, pleasure. So this is not an energy podcast. This is a legal podcast. <laughs> sorry for the diversion. No, no, I'm sorry. Oh, one last question about the energy. Sorry, folks. We're going to get back to the legal part in a second. Um, are there some, like, positives to it? Like, do you find yourself, like, in the, in the periods where the energy is off, do you find yourself, like, you said you started candle making, or do you start... Do you step into a different flow of life or you just find a way to work as normal? Yeah, well, you know, um, South Africans have a great sense of humor. And um, and so there's some fabulous strokes that go around, which which is entertaining and, and, and puts a lighthearted uh, slant on something that's very annoying. Um, and yeah, and um it goes off, it goes off. We light the candles. We go to bed a lot earlier, especially if it's low shedding 8 till 11. <laughs> you, you know, you might as well go to bed and you've got the candle or you've got a, 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 a torch to read by or whatever. Yeah, it is what it is. So then I, I suppose you could say that certainly in the evenings, it's, things can slow down more so than would normal. Um, and you just you just get used to it actually and i don't know if that's a good or a bad thing because um 
antipathy is not necessarily the best way to to deal with it, but you don't have much choice. So you are a lawyer, and I think you've been admitted to practice since 1994? That's correct. So tell yeah. us a, tell us a little bit about yourself and your legal journey. You were admitted in 1994, and you went out on your own in 1995? Mm -hmm. Now yeah. that takes some confidence and some oomph. Tell me about that. Well, I think it was more default than than to be able to take any credit, to be quite honest. South Africa at that time was very much um, a male-dominated society in law. Uh, to give you an idea that when I did my articles in 92, um, in Cape Town, in all, from all the law firms, there was only one female director of a law firm. Wow. That was in 92. And um, it, which is hard to believe. We, we you, you can almost not believe that that is true, but it is true. And um, it, it's 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 very different now. But then what happened when I was pregnant in my last year of articles, which was in ninety four, I fell pregnant in the last six months uh, with my first child, and I was late thirties already, and um, so my what do you call it, my, my, my articles, I don't know what you call it in, in other jurisdictions, but two years of training that you've got to do uh, before you get admitted as an attorney. So we call it articles or we call it a candidate attorney. And um, I didn't go permanently or was not offered a position permanently in the firm. Uh, so then uh, my child was born, and in the last six months of the year, I lectured um, at the University of, of Western Cape in company law and negotiable instruments. And then the following year, uh, I fell pregnant very quickly and had my second son um, in 95, uh, 13 months later. And I was looking, and I was looking, and I was looking and applying for jobs, and I wasn't getting and I was giving a presentation to a child welfare society and I was discussing it with the co-person co who's presenting with me and I mentioned I couldn't uh, obtain a job as a litigator and he said, you're never going to get one because you're female with two children. Really? And it, so it was very much of the, and he said to me, how are you going to do an urgent application if you've got children to pick up from creche and stuff? And I was... I was horrified, um, and I was angry, and but I did then reflect, and it made me realize that, that perhaps that was the reason why uh, I hadn't found a job in about five, six months. I hadn't been able to secure employment. Up until that point, it's always easier to see where the lack is in oneself or try and see what it is that you lack because uh, you can't believe it's something as fundamental as only being female and a mother of two children. Um, and I thought, well, if that's so, and if I'm not going to get a job, um, I'm going to have to create that for myself. And that's what I started. And that's how it happened. So it was default. It wasn't designed. It wasn't my vision. Um, so it happened from a very negative situation, actually. Um, but I've never regretted it. Going through that period of time where you said where you're getting the rejections and you, you turn it in, you internalize that as a lack of yourself or something that I may be lacking. I think adversity is a very strong uh, weapon to have. And uh, I only went to university at age 27, and I'm not going to visit that. But that already tells you that that there was some adversity in my earlier uh, years. And then, and, and never really realizing the whole gender thing. I just didn't realize it for whatever reason. Um, naivety, call it whatever you want, but it was there. And then when I realized that I wasn't going to get a job and I could do it and I really could do it, that adverse situation just propelled me to say, well, if you don't want me, I'll do it myself. I can do this. I, I can do this. Of course I can. And and I did. And I guess that's what there's, there's inner strength in that, you know, in that inner strength and, and belief in yourself when the outside world is telling you, 
oh, you can't do this for whatever reason. You had an inner belief in yourself that was stronger than that outside belief. And you created, you created your opportunity. You created it for yourself. Yeah, so I had to. <laughs> what was it like when you opened your own firm? Did gender issues affect your, did it have any effect on getting clients? Or how did you go about getting clients? I didn't. It, uh, it, gender, that was the only time that I really f strongly felt gender. Um, and in the early days, it wasn't easy. Um, I can't even recall how I actually got clients. Um, but my expenses were very low. Um, I didn't go out and buy high-tech equipment and, and furniture. I went to auctions to buy secondhand office desks and whatever, um, you know, to keep costs low. Took a bond over our house for half of the value of the house uh, to keep me afloat for nine months to ten months of the year, uh, you know, while I was building up a practice and an income. And um, and that took a year. And then in the following year, I was able to pay off the, off the house bond that, that we had taken to help me through this period. And that's thanks to my husband uh, for, for trusting me to to bond our house. Essentially, the first year, I didn't have much of an income for eight, nine months. You know, the odd little yeah. batter, which it, it wasn't paying the expenses for the business or the home. But in the second year, it was fine, yeah. And were you focusing on litigation? Yes. Um, I did a lot of litigation in my two-year article training, uh, be it labor law, uh, which I did a lot of commercial, and uh, I did no family law. Um, I was with the, one of the very big, uh, one of the top two companies in Cape Town. Uh, so it's very much a commercial company. And I did litigation, uh, all, all, all angles of litigation, but not family because they didn't do family. Um, and then when I went on my own, I didn't at attract the corporate. Uh, mm. Even if I had a relationship with yeah. them during that time, they weren't going to... To use me a lot of the corporations like to use the larger firms yeah they will they will and then i started getting um family law started coming in um somehow and again family law was almost a default situation because i wasn't getting the commercial or the labor uh, work um even though i did my masters at a at a commercial level with company law and labor law and i then converted that uh, right at the end to a family law masters um, because i realized that that is the work i was getting and that i needed to with three children do a, a masters in family law were you doing your masters as you were after you already opened up your firm yeah that's when i started and with my children yeah you like to take things easy, huh? <laughs> yes. Somehow manage to meet your deadlines and do everything you needed to do, even though even though you were a woman with children? I did. I did have to sometimes ask colleagues to be a little indulgent if I need an extra day. And once I woke up and I had, had a big trial in Cape Town and the whole legal team had flown down from the other side from Joburg and I had two sick children with temperatures of goodness knows what, and I and I had no childcare because she didn't come in that day, and I was absolutely stuck. Um, but they were great, and so there have been times where those things will happen. Those will just happen. Those things do happen. They happen to men. They happen to family situations. They happen, everyone. you know. Yeah, so, of course, and yeah. I think I have found in my practice. Um, most lawyers, when like some family emergencies came up or something, because I practiced litigation for a while, we were all, you know, respectful and accommodating whenever we could be. I, I, I always did appreciate that with other, yes, um, yes. my lawyer, with other That's lawyers. That's what I found. Yeah. That's what I found as well, because it's always important to, to be respectful to colleagues and to have a good relationship. And you may have different arguments, um, but your colleague is not your enemy um, at all. I practiced in um, a couple of different cities. And in one city, oh, it was the only city, it was when I was, I don't want to offend anyone in Miami, Florida, but when I was practicing in Miami, that's the only time I really had issues with opposing counsel, like 
misstating the record in the court filings, misstating cases. And so every time they're like, you know, normal motion practice, someone files a motion, you file your memo in opposition, and then they can file a reply, and then that's done. But they'd file the motion, I'd file my memo in opposition, they'd file their reply completely misstating everything, you know, and then make an argument based on their misstatement. So I would repeatedly have to file a motion for to you know for leave to file a sir reply to correct the, their misstatements. Oh, okay. And I practiced Terrible. a let's see, I practiced in mostly in um, Miami, Florida, West Palm Beach, Columbus, Ohio, and Tampa, Florida. Miami, Florida is the only place I had to do that. And I don't know if it's just the particular lawyer at you know in those cases, but. Oh, we do get them in Cape Town, make no mistake. But, you know, because we've got quite a small, what I call, pond here of legal practitioners and, and Cape Town's small in terms of numbers. And you know who those attorneys are and you then know how to deal with them. We are taking a brief break from this conversation to ask for your financial support. With each episode, we hope you can see how lawyers and peacemakers like you are contributing to the healing of the world. It takes many kinds of resources for the integrative law movement to keep going and affecting change. Your monetary donation can help us continue this important work by supporting the activities and the members of this community. Each contribution goes to promote the stability and accessibility of the movement and to support basic expenses like our Mighty Network Group, web hosting, social media and event management, and this Integrative Lawyers of the World podcast. Because we like to give people choices, we have ongoing monthly options to match your budget, or you can make a one-time donation. Thanks to our non-profit corporate sponsor, the Renaissance Law Society, US supporters are able to make tax-deductible donations. Supporters from other countries, please check your local tax laws. For ways to support the integrative law movement and our world-changing work, go to our website at www.integrativelaw.com and click on Support the Movement tab at the top of the page. Another great way to support us is to rate us five stars and comment, like, follow or subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, Google, YouTube or your favourite podcast platform. These ratings and interactions Help us get seen and heard by even more people to make an even stronger impact. Thank you for your support and spending time with us today. Enjoy the rest of this conversation. When you were initially having your own firm and started in family law, were you primarily doing it through litigation? And was litigation your primary means of resolving the cases? Yeah. It was. It was. And mediation wasn't a feature in South Africa for many, many years, certainly not in my early years of practice. It didn't exist. Um, And then FAMEX started, which is the Family Associations of Mediation South Africa, um, to bring mediation to South Africa. It's still a very big player in South Africa and does the training and accreditation of mediators. And it took me about five years before I enrolled in 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 mediation even i and i think by then i've been practicing for at least 15 years so it was litigation but what i found at about year 20 and even though i did the training i never did any mediations so let me be clear about that i don't want to say that i did the training and then immediately immediately became a mediator i didn't at all i didn't do any matters and i didn't push it and i didn't really seek it um, so I did the training um, with FAMEC and became an accredited mediator. I didn't do any mediations for five years. And then for me, what I still say was a catalyst was I attended a family law conference, the Miller de Toy Conference in Cape Town. And one of the various breakaway sessions there was, I don't know if she's, she was South African, but now based in New York. Um Mariette Haldanes, and she came to talk about collaborative divorce. And I was blown away. I I just, when I heard her speak, she just spoke to every fiber of my being. And 
And I thought, this is how divorces must be done. I mean, um, I was at a stage where I was finding it very difficult to to do the litigation and deal with the outcomes for families, the negative outcomes for families, and certainly for families going forward in the future after the dissolution of their parents' marriages. And and I went and spoke with her, and anyway, it developed, and then I met uh, Kim Wright, who came over with, to present a course with uh, Amanda Boardman on integrative law, and I attended, and we spoke about collaborative um, and subsequent to that, Kim introduced me to um, various people in the States who did collaborative divorce because I, I really, really felt that that was a home that I wanted to be in uh, professionally. And um, I was invited by Ron Oski and, um, to attend a three or four day conference on which was titled what love's got to do with it and um, there are 50 people i was so fortunate so myself and mandy schultz were the only two people from africa because we were the first people in africa as a continent who wanted to make this a reality but it was early 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 days and so we went we attended the conference but then we attached three weeks on uh, to our trip and the collaborative alliance uh in uh, Minnesota um, gave us a space in the, the offices and for three weeks we were pulled into every aspect of meetings of, of everything so did you work with them on some of the cases that they handled I was yes I was sitting in as an observer not as a as an observer no one ever subject to obviously clients consent and clients there wasn't a single client who didn't consent. So I sat in with the child neutral specialist, whether they were going over a parenting plan or transition phases with young children to new homes, um, to every aspect. And I was blown away. I, I was absolutely blown away. And sorry if I get emotional now. When I left, we'd had a session. I left from a session to the airport uh, to catch my a flight back and we had three young children and it'd been a very difficult divorce it was an ongoing difficult divorce and on this huge whiteboard drawing houses that they were looking at with their mom where they might live and what their house looked like and what my house would look like and there was a path drawn and these children were able to see that this wasn't a terrifying aspect anymore and the past were joining, and it was so beautifully done by, by Sasha Saskia. And I left there, and I was in tears. I was, because that's what I wanted for family law in South Africa. For me, that that was where I wanted to be professionally, but I didn't know if it could become a reality in South Africa. But I was going to try. What a beautiful story of drawing the path between the two homes for the kids. It was lovely. The community in South Africa doesn't quite have the collaborative. It's not there yet. It doesn't have the pathway yet. And here you are creating it, like creating something new or being a part of creating something new again. And part of that, I see that same drive in you of that, that inner belief that this is what I want to do. And this is, you know, this is, why is that so important to you? Do you think? There has to be better options for families that are divorcing. Uh, I don't know what the stats are uh, countrywide, but they're high. Uh, marriages don't last. And there are often children in the middle and they can be ugly. And you don't want children to be polarized. You want children to be free, to love both their parents, warts and all. Children get different things from both parents. You don't have to have a standard message, in my view, because they'll learn from both voices of their parents. But they've got to be free to love both parents, and a divorce can ruin that. It can, a litigious divorce can ruin that, not just for the process of the divorce, for years and years to come. 
I'm not saying that collaborative will solve every divorce, but it can give a beautiful pathway for most, for a lot of divorcing parties rather than go litigation. Is it, I just believe it fundamentally, and no one's going to tell me otherwise. Well, I see it kind of as um, what you focus on expands and what you feed grows. And so in litigation, when the divorced parties are coming into the divorce hurt or angry and filled with that anger and possibly, you know, revenge or spite, litigation feeds the anger, feeds the revenge, feeds the spite. So it grows. Yeah. Whereas, um, collaboration does not feed that collaboration approach addresses it, acknowledge it and says, okay, how can we feed um, a more holistic healing for you and your children to move forward? Absolutely. It, it, it focuses on the positive. It focuses on how much goodwill is there still and to work on the goodwill, even if it's rocky. And, and when a marriage is coming to an end, we know that it's rocky. We know that there's been difficult times. But it's to try and move it into, whether you call it a more positive light, but in a way that you work on the positive rather than, as you say, feed the, the negative, the bad. The, you, can't, you mustn't take that baggage with you. You must try to, what what you call it, dump it, leave it. or, or it, it, it is not helpful in any way to feed that. So if I was a client to you or, or a prospective client comes to you and says, I caught my spouse lying and, and cheating and taking money and hiding it from me and the horrible things that a spouse can do. And we just sit, want a divorce. And what are my options? Look, I don't see those clients anymore either because I only do mediation. So I only take referral work. But before um, I only took referral work, um, uh, so about four years ago, 2008, how I deal with every first consultation, um, would I would tell them what their options were. And I would tell them that there was uh, this was the litigious route and this is the route, route they could take and this is what it would look like and this is what the cost would look like and this could be the outcome for their family. Um, of course, I'd always paint the worst case scenario, but litigation can be that. And then I would discuss mediation and what that was looking like and, you know, you know brief facts about it. And then I would talk about collaborative and um, as, as an option. And I, I would say, you know, obviously, these are the three options and you would need to see uh, what you feel would work best for your family. I, of course, would obviously concentrate more on the collaborative aspect. I had Pauline Tesla's Red Book. I had a couple of copies of that and of Stu Webb's uh, and Ron Oski's book. Um, and I had several copies of that. And I would lend them out and say, read it. Chat to your wife about it. You know, see if this is an option you'd like. Um, so those are your options. And let me know. And obviously, they would need to make a decision from there. So, so I would do that. And everyone who was on our, our trying to get collaborative law off the ground in South Africa did that in the very first consultation. We would discuss the three options with them. And, and obviously, I would say that the outcome, my view, was always going to be the collaborative approach. When you came back from uh, the Collaborative Alliance in Minnesota, it was a profound experience with you, and you were driven and said, collaborative law is my professional home. This is what I want to create. How did you go about doing that? And what's it like in South Africa? So I reached out to those attorneys and family law that I liked the way that they practiced. Um, I liked that they would try to be settlement orientated rather than inflate the uh, issues between the parties. Uh, attorneys who didn't write inflammatory letters and, and all the rest. So I I approached them, had a meeting, had a discussion about it. 
told them about my training and all the things. Um, and it was well received, an initial group of six of us. You know, we've all got different skills. So someone said, we need a website. And I'm like, oh. um, we, so we got somebody's, one of the attorney's wife does technical stuff and set up a website for us, which was called the NACP, which was the National Association of Collaborative Professionals. Um, and we would meet once a month and discuss um, after about a year, I think it was a year that I, I can't put an absolute fine point on it. We did our first training session, which was terrifying um, because now I'm the only person who's literally doing the training there with some of the others, but none of them have been overseas or, or anything. And I felt so ill-equipped when I've got social workers and um, psychologists who've been in practice for 30 years and attorneys and at our first training we have 17 people okay. and, and your uh, training is for lawyers and psychologists and therapists multidisciplinary yeah yeah multidisciplinary because you need child neutrals you need uh oh we also had two accountants as well for financial neutrals and and that and, and um yeah and so that's what we did over two days and yeah i think it I don't know. I think it went fairly well. Uh, I don't know. Um, and we had other trainings after that, but we found that uh, slightly smaller groups worked a bit better, you know, sort of between five and 10, because there's just strictly, it's quite hard to host 16 people with lunches and teas and materials. And, and but the whole team, all of us uh, that were involved uh, and on the committee uh, were part of either getting the, the bundles of documents together. And, um, and it also then gave us some, some income into the, into the NACP, which allowed us to do various things and to open a bank account. Well, we had one, but to pay the costs and, and stuff like that. So, so it went and we met and we'd have an AGM once a year and we'd meet about once a month. Uh, um, and wherever possible, we, we sang the praises. And, and, but we still really weren't picking them up, picking up collaborative matters or not really being able to convince people to engage. And I had a look and, and I think it was in Pauline Tesla's blue book, the more comprehensive book. Uh, she has, I don't know if it's a chapter or whatever, there's a part where she says, if you're not being able to get it, why those reasons might be. And um, and I looked and I looked um, to see where we're trying to do that. And in South Africa, um, it was being discussed by all of us at a first meeting as an option. We were giving the book out for them to consider, answer any questions. Um, but the biggest stumbling block was the issue of costs. And and to me, that was, was, was not an issue to me because it was always going to be cheaper and it was going to be tailor-made in a way in that they were involved, that it, in litigation, his expert, her expert, whether it's a financial child, what, what, what. Um, it was always going to be more cost efficient with, to me, a better outcome over which they, they would have the say. They would make those decisions, which you don't in a court, as you know. And so, um, and that was something I could never get over. I even did a little Excel to say, well, this is how many sessions for this and, and maybe that we would need. And this doesn't even cost you 5% or 10% of what a litigious divorce. But it just never settled well. And all my colleagues had a similar problem. So I don't know, maybe there's something else I hadn't considered. Um, have you been able to overcome that or is that still one of the issues facing collaborative law in South Africa? It is. And I'm very sad to say that during COVID, um, we closed down the association. Um, yeah, very, very sad. Um, and I haven't, I'm not sure to be blunt where the future of that is. Um, the people on the committee were dedicated. Uh, we did everything, but I think that they thought after six, seven years that it, it hadn't got the traction that they would like in terms of their time investment and professional investment and stuff like that. So um, 
so that's that. So so I had a change in my circumstances at the end of 2018, and um, I don't do any litigation anymore. Um, I don't even take on a client uh, unless it's a referral uh, to do a mediation from some colleagues. Um, uh, and I, I don't get any re uh, requests for collaborative, even though that a lot of the attorneys who refer mediation to me uh, are, are the attorneys I dealt with previously, you know, in collaborative. You will get some requests for a collaborative or no, you're primarily getting mediation? Only mediation requests, which is very sad, which is very, very sad. And I think I need to, to think on it again. Um, because I don't want it to, I don't want it to be something that fades away. Maybe if there's people from our community who are, you know, have established collaborative practices in their area, maybe they can reach out to you and give some ideas or support on how to build it in South Africa. Um, yeah. This is just an open message for anyone who's listening um, to do that. Yeah, it's weird why it's I'm always like fascinated. Why do some things take off in some areas and not in others? What is the what what is the stumbling block? You know, I, I don't, don't know. know. I don't know if it's around at the society that that's is in or comes from. And South Africa having coming up coming out of apartheid uh in ninety and uh, let me get my year right, 94. Our first vote was 27th of April, 94. And I don't know to what degree that could have played a role. I remember when I was at that conference, uh, What's Love Got to Do With It? And if I remember, her name was Maria, and she was from from Rio or Sao Paulo, but um, that sort of part of the world. And she was magnetic and um and, and and a bundle of energy. And um she got Pauline Tesla out to do a training and they had 150 people who attended. When Pauline came to South Africa, we had eight. Um okay. And and she and Maria, if that I think that was her name was Maria. Uh she certainly impressed uh on me. Um, said, oh, but if, even if t attorneys don't want to do it, we just say, well, we'll just talk settlement. We won't even have to do the collaborative aspect. We'll just really, between us, say we must settle this. We must focus on reaching a settlement. Um, but in South Africa, the, I mean, I think we're a litigation-prone society. Um, and you, And I don't want to bring politics into it, but if you just look at our politicians, um it's we call it the Stalingrad. I don't know if you have a similar thing. And it's litigation after litigation after litigation. And it's almost inured into the fabric of society in a way. Not necessarily Stalingrad, but to fight. One of the early adopters of collaborative law in Tampa, Nancy Harris, had arranged to have a really promoting collaborative law, not to other lawyers, but to the clients, like prospective clients directly. She did a video of um, one of her clients, you know, her clients authorized, obviously, a video interviewing them and their collaborative experience. And it was kind of a well-known um, individual. So that video, you know, and then she promoted that video. And so that clients are starting to ask their lawyers for it, you know, to start getting getting the people aware, hey, there's yeah. this. So when they go into the firm, you're, okay, you're talking about litigation, but I heard about this other way. Yeah. Um, so tell me about that. And she was of the belief that, you know, she did this because, yes, we have to talk to other lawyers and professionals about it, but uh, but we also have to educate the public so that they know about it and they can ask if once the client comes to the lawyer and says, yeah, you're talking about litigation, but I want you to do collaborative law, lawyers will now start adopting to it. And I think it has, you know, there's, it's been a pretty successful movement in Tampa. Um, Nancy and others were really, were really big in that. And I just know that's one of the things they did. I, I think that's helpful. And I mean, as I said, the group that we were the NACP, we would always do that and give clients the option. We didn't obviously have the discipline, the, the video, but we had the book, which we would hand out. But I think a video is better because books 
it's a bit, I suppose, who wants to read a book, you know, and a video would be easier and, and more digestible, yeah. I'm sure. And as someone who actually went through the process, um, and I think mm. that's what was helpful. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what could be very helpful. So you had mentioned, I think it was around 2016, 2018, when you switched, you switched from litigate. You said, okay, I'm going to focus solely on mediation. I'm not going to do any more litigation. Would you like to talk a little bit more about what was it that crystallized that for you? Well, again, it it, it was never a conscious decision. It was default. Um, I had a hip, a total hip replacement in the December of 2018, and unfortunately, the um, surgeon cut my sciatic nerve, which rendered me paralyzed from my knee down. And uh, not only paralyzed, I had no sensation at all in legs. So uh, it's a thing called proprioception. So I don't know if my legs on the ground. It's got it. It it just doesn't know where it is in time and space. Um, so I always have to look down to see where my foot lands. And so that was quite life changing. Um, took me a while to learn to walk again. Um, I still have to walk with aids, but that's fine. And I have an adaptive car and all the rest. But that was the moment that I stopped litigation. Uh, I couldn't do it anymore. I didn't want to do it anymore and wasn't going to do it anymore. I was very clear about that. Um, and um, I was, yeah, I was just very clear about that. And so that was a gift to me that I didn't have to do that anymore because uh, I'd been disenchanted. I mean, obviously part of my collaborative journey and mediation journey was to find alternative ways of, of practicing law. And, um, and so uh, I only do mediations now, but it's a brand new business in a way because I didn't take them on before the operation. Even though I was involved with trying to get them off the ground, we really weren't getting the traction at all. Um, but but I like the work. I much prefer it and should have should have realized it years ago, but I didn't, so I didn't. You mentioned loss of feeling in your knee, but did it also create when I hear sciatic nerve, I'm thinking like it creates like pain too. Yes, it does. Yeah, it does. Like you said, trying to walk without realizing if your foot is touching the ground or not, how hard that must be. In your email, you didn't focus on the difficulties with me. You you said it's one line in there. The shifts to focus solely on mediation is just one of the many positives that came out of this hard time. And for you to see so many positives and focus, again, we're talking about before, you know, do you feed the hurt and feed the pain? You acknowledge it and you deal with it, or do you grow the positives? And it seems like you are one that feeds the positives in your life and let them expand. You know, it's, it's happened. It's a fact. I can't change it. And people would also say that I would be angry with the surgeon, and I wasn't. Um, I was desperately sad at what happened, and it's not what I wanted to happen, but it happened. And so, and I didn't want to litigate um, because I felt that that would just leave me in a completely negative uh, place. And I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to focus on the negative aspects of any of anything that I was undergoing. Um, and I had, and, and, and would focus only on doing that which I, I could do and and improving on that so initially I was going to rehab twice a week um it I got a car adapted car and that was fun learning to drive that and um so 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 that has to be my focus because I don't like the negativity but having said this I must clarify that two weeks before my claim prescribed my judge friend and my senior magistrate friend picked me up they said oh are you free for lunch and I said yes on Tuesday they picked me up and they took me to an attorney and they said, you're not going to let this prescription door close on you um, for a claim. And because it was two weeks away from prescription and it's nothing that I wanted to do. Anyway, so we did engage in that and we're in, we're in it at the moment. And it's not a place that I want to be at all. But it's tricky because my husband feels it's important and I get because financially it's had an impact and health-wise in the future, the cost that that may be. And so I understand that it's 
it doesn't just impact me. It does impact my husband in terms of helping me financially. And so I'm on that journey, but I'm very glad that I left it to the bitter end. There are some cases and some matters that litigation is needed and is the right course for. And this type of matter is. And there's a way that you can go about it, perhaps, like you can still bring your collaborative framework and mindset into this process and lessen it a little bit. Yeah. I agree with you. And um, I have requested my attorney on a number of occasions for us to mediate this with the uh, the insurance, uh, the Medical Protection Society, which insures the doctors uh, who are based in London. And um, they don't have an office in South Africa. And um, they they have said that they're willing to but we've got to get all the reports in. And the reports are horrible. Got to go to an OT. Well, I've been to an OT. Got to go to all the professionals from the neurologist, all the tests, all the OTs, all the forensic psychologists, it, the accountants, the actuaries, it, the orthopedic surgeons. It just doesn't stop. Sorry you're going through that, and I wish you as much peace and ease going through that as you can. There is a um, collaborative practice that focuses on medical malpractice in North Carolina in the United States. And they use, I forget the name um, right now, I'll try to put it in the show notes for anyone who's interested in it. Um, but I, I spoke with the people several years ago, and they had the mindset too for the medical malpractice who used collaborative law and the reason being was they found that a lot of doctors actually welcome the practice and because they like they they want the opportunity to say they're sorry or to apologize it's it's you know for them too and for the patient, sometimes that is almost as important or sometimes even more depending on the finances of any financial settlement. And it's just the administrators that blocked it. So they were able to do this pilot program for collaborative law and medical malpractice. And I, at least as of five, six years ago, it was doing quite well. I still see the same surgeon. I still see him. Um, I never, he never stopped treating me. Um, and he and I have very open discussions, and it was as hard on him, and he'd been a surgeon for 27 years, and on me in a different way, but it, it really knocked him, uh, and so so we both suffered through this, and, and I don't hold it against him, and if he had a choice, he, he, he would want the insurance company to pay me whatever it is that they, they're willing to do. Um, he's not hidden from it, he has not denied it. He's been incredibly apologetic. And we, and I, I like the way that I've dealt with him and continue to deal with him um, with no blaming, no, no nothing. Just I like the way I deal with him and continue to see him. You are living in alignment with your values and your principles, even when it affects you so personally, you know, that. We call that integrity. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Is there anything else that you would like to share with us? I would love to leave a legacy that collaborative law is a real option in South Africa that people give serious consideration to, along with mediation. And for those who want to litigate, well, then they must do it, but it's just not going to be on my ticket. And I'd love to leave that as a legacy. And... In a way, I do feel that I have failed um, in not getting it off the ground in those seven years. Um, well, I did fail. It's as simple as that. We deregistered de in, in COVID. Um, but it's not a dream that I think has gone forever. Um, and it is something that I would really, really, I'd like it to happen. Yeah. Well, it's a beautiful dream. It kind of hurt me a little bit when I heard you say, you felt that you failed and you said, well, I did fail I did. because I'm looking at you and I see someone who is trying to start something new 
that adds light to the community and to families and to children. But there's a whole lot of litigation mud there. Like it's, I, I'm thinking when I'm saying litigation mud, I'm thinking like, you know, you're trying to bring something new with like a mud. It, it takes a while for it to clean off and to get use of it. So um, it's like treacle. Yeah. Once my cousin and I, we were young, we were like maybe like 10, 11. Her mom and dad took us to visit one of the, their elderly aunts that lived in a rural area, but like almost on her own little mountain top, like, and it wasn't like a big little, maybe a hill, maybe, but it came to a point and the house was on the top and there was a road that went around it in a circle. And so my cousin and I, we just went for a walk around it. It was like maybe a couple of miles long. Somehow we got lost on this road that went in a circle. <laughs> my aunt and uncle, they found us and they said, this is what happened. You guys would go here and we would see like, you know, like, so here's the beginning of the circle. You'd go here, and right before you got to the part where you'd almost be home, we saw your tracks, and you would turn around. <laughs> and then you would come back here, and you would see your tracks and turn around. To our defense, someone had, like, built, like, a road, like, that kind of, like, veered off a little bit, so it got a little confusing to us. Okay. I don't know. Whatever. But the, the, why I'm saying this is, is that so often I have to be mindful of myself, like, when I'm trying to do things, am i on the wrong path or have i failed in the time or have i i'm so close i just don't see the finish line you know yeah, so yeah. you're on the path right here but in this time frame maybe collaborative law to take off in south africa it needs to take 15 years and it never would have gone there but for you and your other colleagues doing what you did with the National Association of Collaborative Professionals, you know? I've got to think on it a bit more and, and, and see what I can plan. And um, I don't like the fact that, that it doesn't exist anymore. Even though we weren't getting, I think some people thought it would generate work for them. And for me, it's never been an issue to generate work. It was always for me a way of resolving conflict differently so so maybe my my focus is different um but um i don't think i'm finished with it let's put it that way not i don't think i know i'm not finished with it so when you sit and think what is it that you do like why it didn't work before uh, more i think to to look at that to think uh, uh, and once you can really know that honestly to figure out can you do it differently or how can you I don't want to say sell it different package it different whatever word you want to use because um, we had a dedicated team there's no question about that um, why did the costing become such an issue can one packet it differently um, and, and and we did we did excels we did comparisons for clients they could see it in black and white uh, it still didn't work from everything that you have shared with me I have full confidence that I don't know how your dream's going to be realized or when, but I 100% see it being realized because you've already created new things in the past. You you do this and you do it successfully. Um, and I so admire that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so we end every episode with asking our guest a question about what integrative law means to them. And sometimes I preface it as, you know, Kim, Kim Wright, J. Kim Wright and others started the integrated law movement with a belief in a foundation that there can be a new way to practice law. One that honors our inner self, right? You don't have to be someone else when you're a lawyer. You be your authentic self when you're at, in work, at home. So that honors authenticity honors generosity, honors bravery, and honors the belief that we are interconnected. Whatever, whatever sector of law you practice in, um, wherever you practice in the world, we are interconnected with each other, with society, with others, and with our planet. Um, so with that belief system, 
we see that some lawyers, we, we see them, we're like, oh, that's an integrative lawyer because they share similar beliefs and philosophies, but they themselves haven't quite heard the term integrative law. Um, so with that, I ask you, what does being an integrative lawyer mean to you? I don't see myself as an integrative lawyer, so, well, I don't. But I, but everything you've just said in terms of authenticity, genuineness, honesty, all of those things, to me, is fundamental to practicing law. There, there's just no question about it. Uh, integrity, all of those things. And I also see law as not an island. It's certainly not family law. It, to me, is very multidisciplinary. And you need input from not only wider family, grandparents, but social workers, psychologists, anyone who can assist an impact on a family. You can't just te treat it non-holistically. For me, you've got to treat a family holistically. So I don't know if to that extent that that's in integrative. I don't know. Um, but I believe fundamentally in those principles that you just highlighted completely. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for being part of Integrative Lawyers of the World. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me.